This is Alki Leopoulou, your host of the series of behavioral science talks. So as a member of the board of the directors of the Harvard Kennedy School uh, Alumni Association here in New England, I'd like to welcome everyone from around the world, Harvard affiliates and friends, uh, and welcome our co-sponsor, Harvard Clubs and the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Relations with special thanks to Rachel Crinkle. So the speakers in this series follow an evidence-based approach where assumptions are tested and recommendations are based on data rather than personal judgment. And so today we have with us Professor Niall Bolger, an expert in close relationships. Niall, am I uh, butchering your last name, by the way? Because I've always uh, seen Bolger. it. Bolger. Bolger. OK, That's, I've only seen it. Fun. And yes, uh, I realized. Yeah. So Bolger, thank you so much. So Niall, uh, a professor of psychology, Department of Psychology at Columbia, director uh, of the Couples Labs at Columbia, and very well cited with over 40,000 citations uh, so far. So before we start, quick updates. Uh, I'll paste everything in the chat as well. So May 6th, uh, 6th uh, we have Professor uh, Robin Dunbar, uh, University of Oxford, where he's going to talk to us about friends and understanding the power of important relationships. Um, we've uh, started uploading uh, past videos of our talks in a YouTube channel, and you can subscribe if you want to be notified for uploads. And if you'd like to support our work, I'll paste the link here as well. So I'm going to paste everything here so you guys have it. Um, all right. So you should have everything together. And then just a basic housekeeping and we're ready to start. So thanks again for everyone for adding your questions. Uh, we'll have a chat uh, today with now for about 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And then uh, throughout, you can add your Q your questions in the Q&A faction at the bottom of your Zoom app, or even better, just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, ask your question. So now, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. So you you you're, um, you study close relationships. How many years have you done that so far? Well, uh, pretty much since I um, since I got my PhD. So that's uh, that's back in the late eighties. So that's a few decades now. I think um, uh, I've used a variety of methods to do to study relationships. Uh, a lot of them have involved um, studying couples in daily life, where I've had people complete these short daily questionnaires at the end of the day to tell me what happened during the day. And so I've, I've used that method to get a, a sort of an in detail kind of picture of what's happening every day over a series of weeks for usually for, for couples. And sometimes I've used this method around some really big event where one person in the couple has to do something really important, like take a, an exam to be a lawyer. So that's one big study that, that I did. Or anything like, you know, a, a yearly mammogram. That's something that, you know, for people who are at risk is, is a very uh, worrisome time. And, and so, so it's a time when people, when people can help. And, and I'm interested in, in detecting how they can and, and uh, or not help them. So, so if we if we are to give some definitions, what makes um, a stressful event? Well, I suppose at its most general, it's some um, experience that you have to go through that's going to um, demand more from you than you think you can provide, or or that there's a danger. But that's what's going to happen. So if we take something like a really big event, like, you know, so to be a, a lawyer in, in the United States, you have to pass the bar exam. And that's a two day test. Um, the first day is a general one. And then the second is a state one. And in that test, you have to have a vast amounts of facts at your disposal. You have to sort of people cram for it. And then they have to be on top form that day. So it's highly demanding. And so it's stressful. But of course, you know, for some people, maybe they are, they've studied hard, they're ready for it. And it, and although it's stressful, it's not an unpleasant thing because they have the resources to meet those demands. And that's the ideal, really. And, and it can. You know, so so when it works, so so when you can meet the demands of a situation like that, you can feel a sense of accomplishment and mastery. 
but of course you can also um, feel overwhelmed. And of course there are some events that are just extremely stressful and it's not really a case of mastering it, it's a case of just enduring it. And I, I feel like this past year has been a bit like that for all of us to be kind of semi hermits uh, in, in our homes and um, not able to do the things we, we normally do to see the people we normally see. And that's a very special type of stress, sometimes right. called chronic stress. Um, it's hard to know what, what you can do in those situations. So and it's a, a loss of a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a difference between events like the COVID uh, pandemic or um, the bar exam compared to a more permanent situation like a chronic disease. Do you differentiate? Between yes, no, and the, the literature is very, makes a very clear distinction. Um, the kinds of events that we are, you know, if you like pre-wired to deal with are these, these time limited challenges, you know, running away from, from the tiger, um, uh, you know, having to, you know, find your next meal, uh, some some kind of thing that where there's you know a clear goal um, and ideally a way to reach it mm -hmm. um, that can really be distinguished from well chronic chronic stressors can um, you know the the question is how long now you know I I would regard the COVID era as as an unprecedented chronic stressor for lots of people. It just was unexpected. It, it took away a lot of what we normally regard as essential things in our daily lives. Um, but it is time limited. I, right. I, I don't know about, about the rest of the uh, audience, but I've, I've had my first shot. I'm expecting another in a couple of weeks. And, and, and I mean, the end, I hope, is, is in sight. Right. But there are other things like Imagine being in a really bad job or a bad marriage. Um, these things can seem and be just chronically bad day after day after day. And, and, and the kind of things that we are able to do that, 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 that are instinctual to us don't always help in those situations. And then just a, a second definition, and then we'll get into the more specifics. Uh, when you say close relationships, what falls under close relationships? Yes, it's a, it's a general term. Um, it, it essentially means anybody in your life that you have a lot of contact with and that matters for you either emotionally or um, or physically or for you know for your livelihood so we can distinguish in there a, a number of types so one of course is is your part, life partner or spouse or somebody of that nature a really really close friend someone you see every day or you live with um, there are these more professional relationships that we have that also can qualify. I mean, if you're working very closely with somebody every day in work, it could be a supervisor, it could be a subordinate, but what you do and what they do affects one, one another. And so that also uh, qualifies. Parent-child relationships are also extremely close in, in that sense that each person has, has the has an ability to really affect the other in, in a variety of ways. Um, it's asymmetrical in the case of a parent and child usually. And maybe you could say in a work relationship, your boss you know, can pay attention to you, but, but sometimes not, but you're always wondering what your boss is thinking. And that's another asymmetric relationship. But, but these, these would all qualify, um, but different people study different things. I, for example, study people who are in marital type relationships. Um, 
and uh, that's been been my so I so I don't study parents and kids, but some of the some of the things that I am interested in are relevant to a variety of relationships, and, and I hope that if we do get into questions that I that I can stretch into other types and not just talk about what it means to be to be living with somebody in a in a committed relationship for for months and years. So uh, this this question comes a lot um, co comes up often. Um, is there a healthy number of how many close relationships one can have, or an average? Yes. Well, I, your your upcoming speaker, Robin Dunbar, I'm sure will have plenty to say about this. I think it varies. I mean, people like Dunbar and 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 people who's who who theorize about how we used to be back in evolutionary time when we, you know, before, before humans developed agriculture, you know, humans were in smallish groups. Now, how small, I don't know, but I imagine it, you know, you, you might not expect to know more than 30 people or, you know, in a, in a, in a or, or, or maybe, well, you know, the Dunbar number, I, I forget what it is, but it's, it's a number that's considerably higher than, than that. But I think these days, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of connections that, that we have through social media, but, but really close relationships. I, I don't think a lot of people have very many. It, it's got, it will have a fair amount to do with what your preferences are. Um, so some, some people like to have lots of friends and and you know they may count, you know, fifteen people as really close to them. Whereas, I would think the more typical person would, you know, would would it would be a smaller number. You know, um, who knows? Maybe five or six people. Maybe two or three. Um, you know, just back to this experience this past year. You know, I think we we have been, you know. We've all been cut off from from a, a certain type of social contact, uh, real physical presence of others, and I think no matter how much you are kind of shy and prefer to not see too many people, I I can't. There must be very few people in my mind who've been happy with the level of social, real social contact that they've that we've been able to have um, in this past year. Um, whether it's being in person, and then that's leaving aside just the whole fact that we we can't really touch one another, we can't get close to one another. So now you um, you're a special, I think, case of a, of a professor that teaches both social relationships classes and statistics. I don't think this is very common for a professor. Oh, it's like probably it. not. Probably right. not actually. And um, so there was there was there was a. a just yesterday again, there was a high profile research that was debunked uh, and they just realized that the, the data don't add up and they can't replicate. Uh, can you tell us more about the replication crisis and uh, the importance of it? Yeah. Yes, oh, well, it's, it's, been a, it's been a rough period uh, to be, um, well, I think in science in general, but it, it has hit psychology particularly hard and you know, my more general field is social psychology, and there's been, you know, what's happened is that, you know, there, there have been very high profile studies that were published in journals that we expect to not be publishing things that won't replicate. Um, and attempts to replicate some of these studies have failed. Now, the dust hasn't settled on this. You know, I've been teaching statistics for most of my uh, career. So I've always felt that things like making sure that your measures are good, making sure that you have enough people to be able to make um, reasonable generalizations, these things have always been important to me. And I've tried to. Um, emphasize them in, in, um, with my students and in, in my own work. So I've, I've found the emphasis on you know, doing the statistics correctly, making sure that to the extent that you can, 
that you let everyone know exactly what you did, exactly what statistics, and that you make your de-identified data, you know, so not not any not confidential data, but the but the numbers that are really that really matter for your statistics. I've I've always believed that we should be open about those things. This has all started to happen. I mean, it, it has already, this, there's been a huge shift in, in the way people, there's been re less research published and more research that is based on bigger samples and where external experts can examine the data. So I, I think that it's been, it's been very sobering. Uh, personally, the, for me, I've, I felt like, okay, now, you know, people, people's eyes would just glaze over when I would talk about, well, the need for a big enough sample. And now their eyes they don't, they don't glaze over as much. I'm talking about colleagues who, who really just rather think about the, you know, the, 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 the substance of, of psychology and, and what, whatever their scientific field is. But I, I think that you can't separate the rigor of the methods from, from, from the kind of conclusions. So I, I find that people are more open to learning statistics and, and, and trying to do things correctly. And I've seen a big change in the sample sizes that people are using and the norm that, that whatever you've done with your data, you, you have to make them available to other experts to check. And that is going to make all of us be better researchers. And so I, I'm, it's, it's been a hard time, but I also feel like it's, it's probably been necessary. And we, we don't know, you know, we, we, we're still not sure about certain classic findings, whether they, they will hold up. I'll say some of the attempts to replicate studies haven't been great attempts at replication. So the failures to replicate some studies have not been for me, you know, definitive in saying, you know, the original work was wrong. And I think we just have to let the dust settle. But I'm glad you asked that question because, because I've had mixed feelings. I've, I've felt like people should always have been paying more attention to these things. And now that they do, I feel like I have more to say, uh, or, or more people are interested in taking my classes, I find, than, uh, than, than might have been. So, so there's good and bad here. So, yeah, and I think what's important as well is that journals also reward replication studies, where in the past you always had to come up with something new, and now a lot of journals are, are encouraging this effort of can you find a classical finding or some, some other researcher's finding and replicate it follow the exact steps of that study, copy everything that the other researcher did, and then see if you'll find the same effect or not and the same results. So what are some key findings in the field of close relationships that uh, have been replicated and that you, you know, it's, it's good for everyone to know, I guess. Right, well, the, the most fundamental thing is that by any measure you take, um, to do with psychological well-being, to do with physical health, to do with mortality, longevity. People who are um, socially integrated do better on all of these things. So when I say socially integrated, they are people who can say, I have at least one person that I can really depend on. Um, uh, I have an active social life. I, um, I'm involved in, you know, in, in uh, churches, I, I'm in sports groups, I'm in, um, I'm, I mean, in, in a sense, I'm, well, I, I guess I can, I can give you the opposite. Imagine that all you are, all you're doing is you're, you're, you're at home and you're not in contact with people. That is, that's a, that's a, you know, epidemiologists would regard that as a risk factor for all kinds of diseases. And I don't want to make it seem like um, it's, it all goes one way, you know. I mean, to be healthy, you have to be active. You have to get out 
and about. You, you have to engage with, with others. So, so some of this is, is that you need to be healthy, to be part of networks of people. But in the best studies, and there have been, and we are now talking about a variety of fields from medicine to you know, public health, to epidemiology, psychology, sociology, and even economics, the, the, the evidence for the benefits of close relationships is, is just, no, nobody questions it. Um, the, real, the real puzzle is, is how do they matter? And, and, there, and there probably isn't one exact mechanism, uh, but, but I can tell you one puzzle that I've um, uh, tried to deal with, which is you, one of the early and you know, very plausible um, hypotheses about why is it good to be socially integrated as opposed to be isolated. Uh, one, one major hypothesis is that when, when things go wrong, or when you have difficulties or challenges in your life, there are other people there who can help you, that you can ask for help or can just be there to help you. And so this idea of the stress buffering effects of, of social relationships has been around for a long time. And, you know, you can... You, you can find evidence for it in a gross way, in a, in a you know, so, so again, you, you, you can see that, you know, people who are, who have friends uh, that they can depend on, you know, when they become unemployed, you know, they don't, they're less likely to get depressed. They may be able to get jobs again more quickly, all those things. So we, we have all those, we've all that evidence, but but what I have been very interested in doing is actually seeing the interpersonal events that happen when people who are in relationships have difficult things to deal with. So, and, and here's where the puzzle has come up, is that it's been really hard to show that when people are stressed, that what other people do for them is helpful. I know it might seem like, well, how could, how could that be hard? But it, but it has been hard. And one thing that has been very puzzling is that, is that, is that when you ask people, okay, you got unemployed, um, what, what did you do to cope with this and how has it been going? Um, the people who say that they got a lot of help from others are often the people who are saying that they are doing worse. And that you know, has really been difficult to make sense of because, because they should be the people who are benefiting because others are trying to help them. And so this has led me to propose that a lot of what we get that benefits us from close relationships involves help that we don't have to explicitly ask for. That a lot of it is part of the routines that we have with the people we live with and the friends that, that we have. And so our interactions are not ones where, okay, it's been a terrible day, you know, help me, you know, make me feel better. I, like if we, if we take that example, when people do come home, you know, unhappy from, from work. Of course, it hasn't been happening to lots of us because we've been at home. <laughs> Maybe we've been at work, but we've not got, we haven't had that, um, that separation of home and work. But, you know, in good relationships, you don't have to ask. The person, you know, people around you can sense it. They can adjust to your behavior. They can do things like maybe do the dishes or whatever, things that you, that if you were in better shape or in better form that you, you know, maybe it's your turn to do it. But, but the people close to us can help us in ways that are not, that we can't um, articulate. And, and so by that reasoning, when, 
when we ask people, well, you know, did anybody help you? We're already finding situations there where, where the sort of natural unasked for but helpful presence of others has failed and you've had to be more explicit and plead for help. So, so let's, that, that's, yeah. That, yeah, so that's, that's my thesis for why, why I think a lot of what's beneficial about our close relationships is something that's sort of under the radar for a lot of us. Let's, let's unpack that because you are very well known for, for this concept, uh, this work of invisible support uh, that you've, yes. uh, you've done. So um, let's, let's understand, first of all, the benefits of good support. If, if the support is good, either visible or invisible, what are the benefits uh, on, on both us, like the individual that receives it and the relationships in general? Yes. So if you define a stressful situation as one where you, you, there's, there's some goal that you're trying to achieve and, and it could just be, you know, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, get dinner ready for, you know, tonight, but, but you're, you're tired and you are finding it harder than, than usual. Um, in good relationships, those around you, whether they know it or not, can make this situation easier. They, they can help out or they can get out of your way. That, that sometimes is all that's necessary. They can, and, and they may be doing this without really thinking about what they're doing as being supportive. It's just, they, they know you, they know what works and they, we, we may have a situation where their behavior enables you to do what's necessary to achieve the goal that you want or to, to yeah, to, to accomplish something that's important to you. And this is, a, is not a process that you can tell someone like me and if I interview you, or your partner may not be able to really articulate what's going on. And if that's the case, then we may not, you know, the methods that we normally use to try and see how people help one another um, may, may not be, you know, adequate to, to the task. So, so I've been using this idea to, to explore, um, you know, what's helpful in, in situations. And I have evidence that, you know, both in a, a lab situation where you can sort of set up a, a stressful event or in daily life that, that the help that is, that you don't notice is usually the better kind for you. Now, not, not always, because I don't want to make it seem like um, the, the goal is always to be helpful without letting the person know you're helping them because there's many situations where you need the help, you're at, you ask for it, you get it from people who, who care about you. But I think we miss a lot of it. We miss a lot of the, so the benefits of social relationships are being often, they come from routine interactions where, each person is benefiting, but they can't they don't necessarily not necessarily able to articulate it. But if you take that person away, then there will be some real distress and or or a or a sense that something is something really fundamental is missing. And I so, feel like we 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 have all at some level been experiencing versions of this because so of. Yeah, if I'm to rephrase the difference, uh, so for visible support, it's something that's more direct and someone yes. understands, hey, this person is helping me. Yeah. And then when, when it's invisible, it's more indirect and you can understand that it's help. You don't interpret it as help. Yes. Now, what's the advantage of that? Well, if, well, I suppose it does matter. What, is it important for you to be able to just feel that you're smoothly doing the things that you want to do? or that 
you're having difficulty and that someone is coming in explicitly, you know, sorting out a, a problem for you. Now, part of what makes it so great to be in relationships is that people can do that for us. But, but I don't believe that that's the way we go about our relationships most of the time. I mean, we, we, we have, I'll call them habits. Um, and of course, habits can be good and bad. And, and, and I don't want to make it seem like all that happens in close relationships is positive. I mean, by, I, I would, that, that, that's just obviously not, not true. But we are, um, we expect them. At, at some deep psychological sense, we, we, we have a, a need for, um, uh, people call it different things, a need, a need to belong, a need for closeness. Um, there, there's obviously, um, there's obviously, you know, mating and reproduction and those kinds of things that we, we can think of. But outside of all of that, there, there is the idea of just being on your own and living your life that way. I, yes, there are some people for whom that's what they want, but the vast majority of people are not that way. And yet at the same time, they don't, I, I don't think that they're thinking of what it means to be living with somebody is that you're always sort of figuring, well, what do they want and what I should give them and what they should give me. If you can imagine a, a life like that, it would be, it would be really be hard work. And, and uh, you, you know, I think that people, people have ways of, of being together um, that over time explain these health benefits that we see or the health deficits that we see when people are socially isolated and lonely. There is this, um, this golden ratio, the popular golden ratio for, for relationships, the five to one rule, right? For every five, um, for every one negative uh, comment during a fight, uh, there needs to be five positive comments for happy relationships. Is there some type of ratio for visible support and invisible support? That you know, I think that's a very good question. I haven't, I hadn't thought of that. We, we, yes. Yeah, so, the, so this, um, this finding of, about positivity, negativity, yeah, it goes back a long way. I think it, it, it originates in the work of John Gottman. Okay. Um, uh, he, he is a, is an absolute pioneer in the study of, of uh, marital relationships. It's certainly true. I, I don't think just, just in marriage, but in most of our social interactions, um, positivity is expected. And, you know, neg negativity is, is avoided by most people. And so when it, when it happens, it is, it's, it contains a lot of information. You know, it's, suddenly you take notice when somebody is rude to you or, or frowns when you expected them at least just to be, um, you know, non, you know, with, without an expression. Um, with visible and invisible support, well, I think what I like about your question is that I, I, I think that whether it's five to one or not, I, I think that the majority of it is is under the radar. I mean, if 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 I were somebody, and I guess these kinds of things were impossible to imagine years ago, but now maybe not so much. But if I if I had a, a if I could study people, you know, video and sound through a whole day. Um, uh, as an, as an observer, I could probably identify situations where this person, if we took the other person out of the situation, this would be a more difficult situation for, for a particular person. Don't want to make it seem like that's the whole story because people get in our way, people are under our feet, people, um, you know, we would like to see less of certain people, um, but, but I, I think it's, I don't know that I'd say it's five to one, 
but I would certainly they're more invisible. I think I'd safely say three to one. <laughs> okay. That, and and I think it's just it's you can't articulate it, but you would know if you suddenly lost, lost that person. person. There you you know. I mean, I, I think for men, a, a lot of a lot of men probably benefit from more from um, being in relationships than women. Um, I, I would imagine that their daily schedule is is more constrained. Maybe their health behaviors are less uh, extreme. Um, but I think everybody benefits. So just to uh, close up um, the discussion here before we open up the for the Q and A. Um, what can we do to improve in this, in this field? Is there, is there a way for us to, to become more skillful in our support? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps yeah. increase our empath empathic accuracy and even identify when should we give visible support and when should we give invisible support? Right. Well, one thing I should have said, and you did kind of uh, touch on it, is that helping others is a major source of positivity in people's lives. I mean, it, it's you know, to see, for you to be able to do something for somebody else demonstrates that you, you know, you have, you have something valuable that you could do. And it is very gratifying to see somebody appreciate that. So, so that, that's a visible support um, situation, what I've described. Somebody in need, you know, some, you know, someone can't get, can't get something to work on their computer, but somebody else knows the answer and they just do it for you. And you're very grateful. And that is, um, that's a visible support interaction. They, it, now, what about a situation where somebody probably can solve the problem, but somebody else sort of butts in and does it for you. Now that that's a situation where you didn't ask for the help. And if you were left to your own devices, you might solve the problem. That person helping you, well, you know, it's going to depend on this, the details, but you might, you might actually think, oh, thank you. You know, that's, that's good. But now you haven't learned, you, you haven't, had the experience of just solving it yourself and the sense of mastery that that gives you. I think parents, how they structure the lives of their kids is an example of this that sort of is relevant to adult relationships. So parents provide the kind of scaffolding for their kids, for their children to learn how to do things. And, you know, I would imagine good parents don't just go in and every time the kid has a problem, they solve it for them. They just make it so that the situation is one where the child can have a sense of mastery themselves and be helped when they need, they need it. But I, I think that if we are going to be skillful supporters, we should try to be aware of helping I think when somebody asks for it, well, then there's just no doubt. They're, they're looking for help. Um, if you are going to be helpful, um, I think it can, there are various ways that you can make the help be something that, is, that isn't experienced as, oh, you're having trouble and I'm going to solve the problem for you. So in some of my papers, I've talked about messages that define the problem as, a we problem, you know, oh damn, you know, how are we gonna solve this, you know, and rather than, you know, you're having trouble. So you can, you can be, ex you can, it, so invisible support does not mean that the person isn't aware that some interaction is going on. It's just that it's, it's not defined as you're in trouble, I have the solution and here I'm doing it for you. So to the extent that we can be empathic, we can see how to interact in such a way that, so skillful supporters can do this. Skillful parents can have kids learn things where the parent is very carefully set up the situation where the child can learn and feel like they've solved it themselves. And maybe they have, but 
maybe they actually did have help. Um, so, but I think just, just to be clear about the more general phenomenon, I think that good relationships involve this back and forth of helping that is unnoticed on both sides. So people are doing this for one another all the time. And that is what it means to be in a good in a good relation. That's that's what that's why people choose. That's why people talk about we, and not I all the time. I'm gonna start opening it up uh, to the to the audience for questions. Feel free to raise your hand as well. And I'm gonna just uh, ask a question that came up a lot um, for COVID. Uh, what are what are what are we seeing? Uh, I know you're running a study, uh, but you're not, you don't have results yet, but from other don't. people's results that you can uh, feel that you can actually um, trust, what are the findings that we have, especially when it comes to seniors that are isolated? Well, you know, this is one of the more interesting things, surprising things that um, a, a group uh, at Columbia has, has found. It's, it's, this work is, isn't published, but it is a, it, it involves having um, people of different ages uh, over the course of COVID give um, reports every few weeks. So I think there may have been 12 different points of contact with these people. And, <clears throat> and COVID has been hard for all of us. But it hasn't been as the older people. So, so let's say people 60s and over versus people, you know, teens to you know early 30s. There somehow it hasn't been from the from the reports of people that the it hasn't been as bad for people who are older. Now, you know, why is that? Well, I mean, it can partly have something to do with how much you've lost by being stuck at home and not being able to be out and active. I mean, maybe maybe people who are older are are you know don't need to do this as much. There's certainly evidence that people who are older, by choice, have less um, close relationships. And they're, they're more particular about who they spend their time with. Um, younger people are less particular. They, are, they have they have bigger circles of friends. So it may well it may well be that there's just been a greater loss of social life for younger than older. We we don't know, but but that was the big surprise. It's it's not like everybody's having a wonderful time, but the but, there, but, but one would naturally worry about people who don't have a lot of contacts and COVID has just wiped them out. And it doesn't, at least for the people who've been in this study at Columbia, they, this hasn't seemed to be the case. So that, that is, I think, good news. Um, but I, I, I don't want to make it seem like this is, I think that there's been a lot of costs to this year that we won't know about until we get out of it and, and we see what state people are in uh, when, it's, when it's really over. Okay. Uh, going to a question um, in the Q&A. So if um, th there is a difference between the spouse's desire for social life what have you observed? What data do we have around uh, such a conflict? Hmm. With the yeah, I, and is there something that can happen to change? Well, people tend to live with other people who have similar interests and uh, I'm speaking very, very generally, but even allowing for that, there, are, there, there will be lots of differences. There'll be mismatches, and this can be something that changes over the course of a of a of a life. Mismatches in how much somebody else wants to, um, you know, be out and about versus not. Um, 
what it's it's a difficult thing to know what to say about this. I mean, a good relationship involves give and take. Um, you know, I th if I think of my own relationship, you know, my, my wife is a much more outgoing person. You know, she she likes to go out to to events and meetings and think things where I I'm less inclined to do it. Uh, just don't quite have her energy. And so I think we, we balance this by, you know, I go out to more things than I would ideally like to, and she doesn't go out to as many things as she would ideally like to. And we have reached a, a kind of equilibrium. Now in COVID, even I'm thinking, I think we need to get out more, you know, and, and, and she's, she feels like it's, you know, it, a terrible loss, you know, all the, uh, all the, I mean, we live in New York City, there's, there's a lot that you could do. And yet you've never, I've never seen uh, a town so, so dead, you know, um, I'm sure Boston and other major cities, you know, they have to be similar. Um, so I guess if you're, if you're the kind of person who, you know, is afraid of missing out, well, there's no, no danger of that anymore. So all these Broadway shows that I haven't been going to regularly, well, I'm not missing them now because there just aren't any Broadway shows. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm being facetious here about a serious question. Right, no, but yeah, you, this is, I guess this is the reality that we're having at this point. Um, do we, there is something kind of more uh, around the brain uh, impact if there is any brain chemical effects on brain chemicals from supporting and receiving support um well there's there's definitely um there's research on you know on animals rodents um the touch of 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 you know of mothers you know, rat pups need to be touched and and uh, licked and groomed. Apparently, is is vital for for um, for all mammals to be. Um, and and so I, I'm less aware of the kind of chemicals involved um, in humans. But one one that's talked about a lot is oxytocin. So this is a a brain chemical that is often associated with um, being in, um, in social settings. It, 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 it often is associated with um, uh, actually being better at reading social cues. That, that's some work that uh, somebody that I've collaborated with showed. So, so there, there are, you know, we, our, our brains are social in nature. I mean, that's not all they can do, but we have, we have dedicated parts of our brains dedicated to just recognizing faces. These, these, the, what's called the fusiform face area, that's there only for faces, not for, you know, rocks or the sea or mountains, but faces. And that makes sense. There are other brain systems that seem to be, um, that seem to be active uh, when we're observing others, um, so we we are wired for social life, and um, you know we're not like you know there are certain animal species you know I, I guess there's these voles there's two types of voles there's a um, I don't know which one there's the prairie vole I think let's just say that's the that's the vole that has a lot that, that, that is much more sociable versus the other kind. And, and you can see differences between them in, in oxytocin levels. Well, humans, yes, there are individual differences between us and how much we want to have big groups of friends versus not. But we expect to live with other people. And, um, and so, I have no doubt that if it were possible to look at brain chemistry in detail amongst people who are socially isolated, we, we, we would see things that aren't so great. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, loneliness is a, is a really 
debilitating feeling to have if it's chronic. And um, so I, so we, you know, what, whether we, whether we like, you know, social life has its ups and downs, but we're worse um, if, if we don't have it at, at all. And so, you know, what is a good life? It's, it's, it's a, usually a life with others um, with whom we, we are in a, you know, we have, we have good habits together. We, we enable one another to, to be the kind of people we want to be. And I think that that, again, is a lot of it is very invisible or not explicit. Are there any differences uh, when it comes to visible and invisible support that you've observed between in different cultures or different genders? Well, I think um, well, just stereotypically, I think I think men probably like to feel like they can do things by themselves. There's the, you know, the famous thing of men never asking for directions because that would be a sign of weakness or something. Um, I think I suffer from this a bit myself. Um, so I do think there are, there are gender differences, but I have done some lab experiments where, you know, I've arranged for there to be a demanding situation and I've, had um, supporters give support that's either visible or invisible. And women um, benefit as much from invisible support as men. You know, it's not, it, it, I don't believe it's, um, there, there, may be, there may be differences in, in the ideal amounts, but I do think it matters for both. I'm, I'm told that in more Eastern cultures, um, that the expectation is that everybody helps one another, that you don't, you don't have to ask. Um, um, and in fact, I think probably people are supposed to know what you want and just provide it. So I think, you know, I, I, I mean, this is not, I, I, I don't have experience with Eastern cultures, but I do think um, the, I, I see your need and I am very explicit about giving it to you and you have to thank me. Um, I, I think when, when you're talking about um, uh, cultures that are wh where the, the, where interdependence rather than independence, this is a big distinction that I'm, I'm, I, I presume some of the uh, uh, viewers might, might know about that, you know, in, 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 in North America, the idea is that you're independent. Um, and we might imagine that invisible support uh, is more important in such a culture than one where you're, where you're dependent. Right, yeah, coming from Greece, uh, I learned the concept of unsolicited advice for the first time here in the US. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> Uh, even the logic behind it. So uh, you mentioned help before, and we have a last a question that uh, will take us a last question, I guess. Um, when you give invisible support, a lot of times the concept of thanking and gratitude uh, disappears. Uh, yes. What, what is the role, and and what happens to the relationships when this, you know, when one person is just continuously helping out or continuously taking care of the other person, and there is no reciprocity. Or even yes, well, that is not that is not a that's not a good situation, um, uh, and yet there are some times when when um, you know somebody is ill and you you know you have to take care of them and um, and and you may feel that you're doing you know all this work and not getting thanks. Um, it, I, I don't know what to say about that, except that um, the ideal that I've postulated is one where, 
where both people, let's say if we're just thinking of two people, both people are helping one another to, to roughly the same extent, but that may not be at all times. But when you get into a very dependent relationship, like a, you know, having a sick child or, uh, or a sick parent, well, you know, then, then we get into a situation where, um, you know, there's, there's things like burnout and there's um, gratitude is when, when, when there's an explicit help given by one person to another, the, the, the recipient should, be, should express gratitude and that will make the giver feel good um, so when, when you're in an explicitly helping relationship, then, then we're talking about visible support and then gratitude is, is, is really required. But I think that you can know that you're in a good relationship, even if you can't identify all the ways that being with somebody is making your life better. Um, because we, we are creatures of habit. We develop habits. I mean, we get good and bad habits, but, but we develop habits quickly. And those habits mean that all the things that are going into them are no longer conscious. And that is, that's part of what it may, that is, we're, 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 that's built in. And so when we're in relationships where a lot of this support is habitual. We may not be able to articulate it, but I don't believe that people are clueless about when they're in a good or a bad relationship. I think, I think that they do know, but it makes it hard for someone like me who asks people, well, what exactly happened today that made this a good or a bad day? So I've, I've you know, for researchers, this has been a tough problem. But if we step back from it and ask, what is one of the most important determinants of health and psychological well-being? It is being in a integrated into a social network and having people that you can call close friends and companions. And that's why I study this because I think it's so important. Well, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Alki. Very, very good questions. You've, you've made me think. So thank you so much. And thanks, thanks to everybody who, uh, who tuned in. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.